Hey guys, it's me again. Right now it's nine o'clock on a Friday over here in Maryland on the glorious east coast of these United States. And uh, I just decided to record tonight because uh, I was thinking about t talking about a few different topics that I had on my mind. So I guess the first thing I wanted to go into was a little bit of a I guess, clarification, if you will, on my own religious beliefs, because I do a lot of shows with Jason and uh, a bunch of other friends here in the paranormal community about different topics relating to ghost spirits, monsters, aliens, wizards. It's fun. But the conversations oftentimes go back to spirituality and the topic of religion. And I thought I might share some of my own religious beliefs not all of them but just kind of an introduction into myself uh moving forward just to see where the direction of the show is going and so you guys can get a a good sense of where my foundation lies so i grew up uh in a very christian family uh, i am korean after all and south korea is uh one of the most if not the most a Protestant Christian Asian country in the world. There are other Asian countries that are predominantly Christian, um, places such as like the Philippines. But in terms of like the, um, I guess the closer to the American version of uh, mainstream Protestantism, uh, South Korea is probably by far uh, the most Christian nation. So I grew up in a very Christian family, uh, both parents. They're both very active in the uh, Korean Christian community. Uh, they have been uh, most of their lives as, as I, as has I. I was born into the church, grew up in the church, was raised a Christian, got involved in youth group, youth choir, Bible studies, the whole nine yards. Around, I guess, my college years, I decided to, I don't know, explore different options, I guess. So I started to get into studying of Buddhism, primarily Zen Buddhism, although I don't really consider that a religion because it's not deist. Um, you're not really worshiping something or praying to some higher power or some supernatural beings. For those of you who might not be familiar with uh, Zen Buddhism, it is, in my opinion, probably the most bare bones and austere version of Buddhism. Like you have things like Tibetan Buddhism, which does get more into the mystical side, but Zen Buddhism is more just like practice, meditation, focus. I wouldn't even consider it a, this, this, uh, a religion per se, but more of like a mental discipline. And down the road, I'll get into more detail about how I got into Zen Buddhism when I was in my early 20s. I don't consider myself one now, like at least not practicing. I still hold on to a lot of those ideas. And I still do meditate, and but I, I don't identify, or I didn't until I got into this paranormal community. And the reason why I started to identify more with that when I did get into this scene was because I noticed that there were a lot of Christians primarily like mostly Christians in the scene um, some a lot of atheists didn't really meet too many Buddhists though so I thought you know what Buddhism needs a little bit of representation in this whole paranormal society so I guess I'm the only one that I know around to do it Although I don't think I'm a a great spokesperson, but it's just there's no one else. So I guess it's me. And uh, yeah, I think that's why Jason and I get along so well. You know, he kind of sees himself as trying to represent uh, the Christian worldview in the paranormal community. And I, in maybe not a serious sense of the word, try to see myself as representing the Buddhist worldview in the paranormal community. So, yeah, we kind of, you know, 
Yeah, I think it's a cool dynamic. I like it. When I got into this scene, I started hearing more and more stories and rumors. And I guess at the time, I considered them conspiracy theories of the whole notion of Satanism. Uh, the idea that there is this society out there of people who have completely given themselves over to, I guess, what we would consider the dark side and who've devoted their lives not only to this, to these nefarious, I guess, beings, but also to a life of hedonism and debauchery. And there were times when I thought myself, would I ever be tempted? Like if I was in my full on dirtbag phase, which I did have a full on dirtbag phase, probably in my late 20s, early 30s when I was in Korea. When I was in my full on dirtbag phase and someone had come to me and tried to recruit me into this whole satanic ideology. And they were like, oh, Donnie, if you come join us, you know, you could have all the sex and drugs and partying you could ever want. It would be great. Even at my maximum dirtbagness, I don't even know if I would join. Not because of any loyalty to any particular ideological group or to any spiritual cause. Uh, again, because Zen Buddhism is more of a practical uh, discipline, like a mental discipline, really, than a religion. Um, and I still have my Christian beliefs. Like, even though I left Christianity in my 20s, that doesn't mean I stopped believing that Jesus was the Son of God or that God was real or the Bible is true. Like, I still believed all that. I just didn't want to be a part of the ideology because as I've grown older, I've grown to have a disdain towards aligning myself with any particular group. That was just what it was. And I think that's kind of the reason why I don't consider myself a full on Buddhist or Zen Buddhist, because again, you're still identifying with a group. And one of the things I've come to learn in my 42 years on this planet is to be a lot more like Bruce Lee. And here's what I mean. <clears throat> For a lot of you who are out there who are Bruce Lee fans, you know, you'll know of reading into his biology, uh, biology, what a fucking idiot I am, biography. Um, you know, Bruce Lee was the founder of the martial art that he called Jeet Kune Do. And the reason why he founded Jeet Kune Do was because he had gotten into this battle, I guess a duel, uh, with this Chinese Kung Fu practitioner named Wang Jack Man who uh, was representing all these Chinese elders who were kind of pissed off at Bruce Lee for sharing a lot of their Kung Fu secrets with a bunch of foreigners in the States, white and black people sharing all their secrets. And they weren't, they weren't cool with that. Um, they kind of felt like he was kind of pimping out their culture. So they called in a Chinese Kung Fu champion and he flew over from China to take on Bruce Lee and they met up, um, and they had a fight. And as the story goes, um, there's so many different accounts and versions of what happened. But at the end of the day, Bruce Lee whooped his ass and whooped his ass pretty good. The Wong Jack man himself would contest that. But, you know, a lot of these traditional Chinese Kung Fu dudes, a lot of them are, have their heads up their asses. So who cares? But Bruce Lee, in his fight, and even in his victory, um, before that, he, as a background, he had a uh, background. He trained in Wing Chun. That was his primary, I guess, martial arts background. And I don't remember what Wang Jack Man's uh, martial art was. It was some form of traditional Chinese Kung Fu. But even though Bruce Lee whooped his ass with Wing Chun, he thought, man, this shit was what took way too long. It was too inefficient. I want to think of something better. So he went around and trained with different people, met up with boxers and wrestlers, famously trained with Judo Jean LaBelle to learn grappling, 
got some pointers from like kickboxers and stuff. And he developed Jeet Kune Do, which was kind of in his own mind, a, a mix of everything that he saw as making sense in terms of efficiency and effectiveness. And none of that cheesy traditional crap that would hamper one's natural ability to fight. So, uh, as Bruce Lee got more famous, he came out with his book, and Jeet Kune Do became a big deal. You know, people wanted to join. They wanted to learn to fight like Bruce Lee. Who wouldn't, right? Who wouldn't? A lot of you guys may know his famous book, The Tao of Jeet Kune Do, which uh, he wrote while he was um, unable to really... I mean, he had a major back injury. Dragon the Bruce Lee story, they kind of portray it as he got kicked in the back during a fight. That's not really how it worked. Um, he actually, it was actually a weightlifting uh, injury. He was going too hard in the gym, blew his back out. Literally what happened. So as Jeet Kune Do grew and as Bruce Lee's legend grew, he started to notice something, though. Um, he, he grew to have a disdain for Jeet Kune Do. He didn't like what it was turning into. And his primary rationale was because it had a name. It was a thing. It became its own martial art. It became the very thing that he invented Jeet Kune Do to counter against. Now, what I mean is an ideology like a martial art, you know, it's a word, it's an identity. If you're a karate guy, right, you're here to defend the honor of karate. Maybe someone comes up to you and starts talking shit and says like, hey, I think Muay Thai is better. Now you got to defend the honor of karate. Doesn't matter if, you, if karate is objectively better or more efficient. That's your identity. And someone's dissing on your identity. You got to step up and challenge them. And Bruce Lee started noticing people started doing that with Jeet Kune Do. The idea was he was against the whole notion of an of an identity in the first place. That's why he, that's why he came up with it. He went to boxers and learned the most efficient way to throw a punch and incorporated that into his martial art. He learned from Judo Jean LaBelle how to grapple, uh, joint locks, choke holds, found that they were very efficient incorporated that into his martial art he learned from kickboxers that leg kicks actually work real well and a lot of these traditional martial arts they kind of eschew leg kicks so he decided to incorporate that because again efficient effective but then as his style grew more and more popular it became an ideology it became a name it became Jeet Kune Do. and bruce lee didn't like that so he eventually abandoned it he left it to one of his students to kind of run the entire martial art, but he walked away. That's a detail that the a lot of the, uh, I guess, more casual Bruce Lee fans don't know. Like, even though Bruce Lee came up with Jeet Kune Do, he eventually uh, disowned it because it became its own ideology. And that was the whole reason for inventing it was that to get away from ideology. So I kind of relate to that in terms of like my... I guess religious identity. I don't have one, not because I don't believe in anything or because I choose to be an atheist. I don't consider myself an atheist at all. But I don't want to have my identity wrapped up in an ideology. It's for the same reason that Bruce Lee didn't want to um, stick with Jeet Kune Do. So I look at something like Satanism. I go into the paranormal community and i see that there are you know i learn from people these stories about these secret cabals right not just like gothy ass white kids pretending to be cool and dressing in all black and you know fucking around with dark magic and torturing animals and shit i'm not talking about that those are like the posers i was talking about the ones with like real power right the ones who are real good at keeping things dl right they're more you're more likely to see them in a business suit or in a boardroom than to see them in like some kind of marilyn manson concert wearing stupid ass black makeup or whatever 
right? And there are all sorts of types. Uh, there's sub branches, kind of like Christianity. There's different denominations. And then once I started learning about it more and more, I'm like, yo, man, this is fucking scary. Not the, you know, the fact that they're out there, the fact that they have so much power, so much influence, and a lot more influence than we probably are even willing to admit, especially in our culture and in our society and our economy. Um, there, are, there's a reason why they are oftentimes the source of most conspiracy theories, because how can you not be suspicious of an entire group of people who've devoted themselves to be completely evil and dark? I can never quite understand that. Even though, like, yeah, when I was in my hedonistic, debaucherous days, you know, going out to the clubs, trying to hook up with chicks and party and do all sorts of, you know, stuff. Even then, if you had come up to me then and been like, hey, Donnie, do you want to join Satanism? I'd be like, no. Because being evil 24-7 would just get fucking old. You know, if I was at like an eyes wide shut style party, like an orgy or sacrifice, I'd be the one guy in the corner being like, man, don't you don't y'all people ever get tired of just being fucking evil all the time? Does anyone here want to play like Monopoly or something? Do we have to do an orgy again? Damn it. It's Tuesday. We just had an orgy on Monday. Don't you, let's just put on a freaking movie or something or play Yahtzee. This is getting old, guys, okay? This is all we do, just orgies all day? Think of something new. Does anyone here have, like, a Nintendo? Can we put on some Super Mario Brothers or something? I'm starting to get bored with all this. It's, like, all we do. Think of think of something new, freaking losers. So, yeah, I would not have made a great scene in this. I would have eventually gotten tired of just having to be evil all the time. How the fuck do you just... Right? Because <clears throat> let's say, how about this? Okay. Let's say you do join a cabal of Satanists and you all decide to devote yourself to Satan. You can't really trust anyone or form any real bonds because you're like, oh, well, we're all evil. So I guess, you know, what? We're going to be loyal to each other, have love for one another, form bonds, even though we've devoted ourselves to being completely evil. And that kind of goes counter to forming these deep friendships and relationships. So what I can't, so everyone is kind of just there for hedonism. No, you can't really trust anyone. You can't really open up to anyone, get to know anyone. Oh, you know, just connect on a deeper level. No, we're just going to be fucking all day and doing cocaine. Okay. That's all we're going to do. All right. But some people do fall for that and they're all other, you know, I'm, I'm being a bit facetious here. Uh, I'm sure there are other reasons, more deep-seated reasons why people join. Um, some people thirst for power or money or just to win. And some people have just been so, I guess, fucked up by this crazy-ass world that we live in that they, you know, just naturally fall into that. It happens. So... When I first ever got into the paranormal, before I even started participating in any shows or even met any people, uh, there were two podcasts that were kind of like my springboard into this whole topic. One was Astonishing Legends. And for those of you who um, don't know, uh, it's a real good show. It's like paranormal topics, but they research the shit out of it. Like each episode is like four or five hours long and they go, they have a whole team of researchers. Um, they explore all angles. They go into the history, the skeptical uh, point of view, um, all the background. And yeah, in terms of just solid information and solid uh, research and a very comprehensive look into some of these topics, I highly recommend Astonishing Legends. Uh, that's where I learned a lot about uh, these topics initially. The other uh, favorite podcast of mine 
that was also my major springboard into this whole topic was uh, The Confessionals by Tony Merkel. Some of you guys might already be familiar with that show. Um, and I got to say, so it's some of my favorite podcasting material out there. It's structured a lot like the, for those of you who aren't familiar, it's structured a lot like uh, the Joe Rogan podcast in that they, you know, Tony, the, the host, uh, he sits down with people who've had experiences and he will have like a two, three hour long conversation and he would just let them speak. Um, he doesn't try to impose his own beliefs on them. He just, he's a real good interviewer. He just asks a lot of questions. He gets people comfortable and they just tell their whole story. I've actually thought about being on that show. Um, and I've met and hung out with Tony a few times since, and I do consider him a friend. And hopefully I think he does consider me a friend as well. We've gone on a couple investigations together and Tony, he in person, he is the exact same dude, right? When the cameras turn off, he's the same guy. Um, and that was one of the things that I found very refreshing about him. I'm not quite sure if I'm the same guy in person as opposed to like on these shows. I'm not quite sure. People often say that in person, I'm actually a lot more serious. I'm not quite as goofy as I am on here because I'm not really like trying to put on a show or entertain. So yeah, my in-person personality, I would consider myself to be a lot more serious and a lot more stoic. I do have my serious sides. I am, I'm not goofy all the time. <clears throat> but the reason why I bring this up is because on episode 61 of uh, Tony Merkel's The Confessionals, he had an interview with a guy named Zach King. Zach King, for those, um, and again, episode 61, if you haven't checked it out, go ahead and check it out. Zach King was a former high wizard of the satanic church who had since had a falling out, a very bad falling out to the point where like members of the satanic Satanism were like out to like kill him and he had to go into hiding. But he was the high wizard. And he explained everything. He explained how Satanism worked, how it's structured, how it functions, all the different branches, the roles of like each uh, rank, what a high wizard does. So the high wizard, they're kind of like the magic users, right? They're not the leaders. They're not like the, the major decision makers of the greater satanic movement according to him they're more like the enforcers like they they're the ones who handle the magical side but in terms of like manipulating politics and economics that's like a whole other side but he said when tony asked him what does the uh top head of uh, satanism looks like he said zach king said it's basically a boardroom with like executive types chairman ceos Everyone's in business suits and in the room next door, it's like one guy with a Ouija board getting communications and orders. And then he tells the, the boardroom what's up and they kind of go out and do what they do. That's how it works at the highest levels. It's fucking scary because it's believable. I can see that being the case. I've had my own Ouija board experiences and you know that once it gets going, it's like pretty much being in the chat room or text messaging a supernatural entity directly. It's scary shit. And I can believe it. So yeah, Zach King, uh, episode 61, check it out. And he goes into his whole life story. He goes into like what goes on with like rituals to people, famous people that he's met in his time working as a satanic wizard. Uh, I'm not going to give away any spoilers, but, uh, yeah check it out um but yeah he you know one of the things he talked about was how and oh and he does go into all like the ritual sacrifices and child abuse stuff and he says yeah it does happen he was talking about how in one of the rituals they would basically impregnate a young girl force her to get an abortion, take the fetus, cut out its heart, 
and then she would have to eat it. And I'm like, when he said that, I'm like, first of all, ew, gross. Se- secondly, whoa, that is like dark, like, re- like cartoonishly dark. You know, it's like unbel- Like I would be the one guy in the room, like as a lifelong Satanist, being like, "Damn, this is fucked up." It was almost. It was like so dark. It was like unbelievable. So I'm like, Ugh. yeah, you know what? I'm just gonna take it with a grain of salt. I'm still gonna listen. I'm still gonna be open minded. But something like that. That is just extreme. I d- I don't even know. A few years later, I was with my. Uh, girlfriend at the time we were just hanging out and i remember this day we we had the netflix playing we were at our apartment we're sitting on the couch just kind of flipping through and at the time on netflix i put on a documentary and this documentary was a uh, film that came out in 2004 called a the woman with seven personalities it was the story it's basically a documentary examining the whole phenomena of uh multiple personality disorder as we commonly call it the more technical term is dissociative identity disorder but this woman had uh yeah dissociative identity disorder she had seven personalities her name was helen i believe she lived in the uk and it was basically a documentary following her life uh showing her as like she switches you know to these different personalities like one was like a little girl one was like this dude who was real aggressive and when she was in each personality she, like the other personalities would have no control and they would all kind of just take turns and she sometimes she would have no memory of what happened so she would just kind of wake up in like some random place and she'd be like oh damn one of the personalities took over and it was a lot like memento where they would actually write messages to each other and memos and reminders so i thought that whole notion was fascinating but throughout the course of that film not only are they examining her life but they're also examining the I, the psychological condition of dissociative identity disorder and i learned a couple things one of the things that they mentioned was that you only really see dissociative identity disorder cases in uh, Western countries, Europe and North America. That's it. You don't see it. You don't hear about it in South South America or Africa or Asia. Only in Europe and North America. Hmm, that's odd. For mental illness to only show up in what? Just the Western society? That's weird. Might be a cultural thing, you know? Who knows? The uh, narrator, or the filmmakers, uh, they detail how a lot of these victims or these sufferers of dissociative identity disorder, uh, the most common thing is they they, uh, suffer a lot of sexual trauma as children. A lot of them claim to be victims of child ritual abuse. And this woman, Helen, the subject of this movie, actually makes those claims herself and they interviewed a few other people who suffered from the condition and they all seem to say the same thing that we've suffered child severe sexual trauma as children oftentimes associated with ritual abuse and when helen finally opens up and recounts her memories of the ritual abuse uh she goes into how she was forced to have an abortion as a young girl and they cut out its heart and she had to eat it and i was just like what the fuck because here's the thing that movie or the uh, attitude of the filmmakers they weren't they treated the whole satanic ritual abuse thing as if it was like a delusion like you could tell the filmmakers didn't really take it seriously they didn't notice that it was common uh but they didn't really think of it as maybe there's actually ritual abuse going on it, that wasn't a consideration on their end you could tell by their attitude to, in the narrative and how they interpreted it they saw it as these people had these real experiences but it was sort of like some kind of delusion they agreed that they had like trauma and sexual trauma very young but they didn't you could tell they didn't really buy into the whole satanic ritual thing 
But when I heard the detail of what that Helen woman said happened to her, and then I think back, that is the exact same shit that Zach King said in that fucking podcast episode. My jaw dropped. I was like, oh. I thought that was some cartoonishly evil stuff. I didn't know people were actually doing that kind of shit. And I was like, oh, fuck. Yo, this this shit's darker than I thought. It's realer than I thought. And it is way more fucked up than I thought. I actually, when I first hung out with Tony Merkel, it was for a, a paranormal investigation. It was like the special thing for his show where, um, you know, fans of the show can sign up. It was not cheap, but I had money to burn back then and I had time and it was just when the pandemic was finishing and I figured it would be a cool opportunity to spend a weekend with Tony and finally for the first time in my life, meet some other paranormal people and go on an investigation. And it was a blast. And I met some cool people. I befriended Laura Stevens who got me into this, this scene, uh, which I owe her a big debt of gratitude for. And when I was, when we were on the bus going to the uh, haunted location, I was sitting next to Tony the whole time telling him this story. And he was just like wide eyed, slack jawed, being like, oh my God. So, yeah, shit like that's real. And I think a lot of you people who are watching this show, who have followed me through the other paranormal shows, would agree and have stories of your own and have ideas of your own and similar viewpoints. Um, that kind of shit's out there. It's a lot more ingrained into our society than we would like to believe. And you see it all the time. You know, I was just talking with uh, Jason and Marquise earlier uh, on the podcast about how we see this stuff show up in our kids shows, even in our pop culture, Super Bowl halftime shows, in our music. Like blatant imagery where it's just like, hmm. I guess they're coming out of the woodwork now. I guess it's it's society's gotten so fucked up that they're just going to go out into the open and just do whatever, right? Just have an orgy out in the fucking public, right? Who cares? That's the level to which we have sunk. Hmm. Then you have something like Lil Nas X come out with that music video where he's like lap dancing Satan. Like, really? This is what we're doing? Hmm. I saw that video, by the way. <clears throat> Yeah, he lapped Dan Satan. So. Yeah, I'm not, I don't identify as a Christian, but I identify more as a Buddhist for the sake of the paranormal community. To act as sort of its representative, just because no one else would. But even as a Buddhist, I can tell you one thing. The one thing Buddhists and Christians have in common, we do not like Satanists. With the one thing Christians and Muslims have in common, they don't like Satanists. I'm pretty sure Jewish people aren't fans of Satanists either. And you know what? They teach you in school, don't be racist or prejudiced, which I agree with. But yo, if, a, if I was a bus driver and some Satanist showed up in my bus, I'd be like, yo, you sit in the back of the bus. Fucking... We don't like your kind around here. You sitting back the bus. Oh, you get one of them crappy bathrooms. You don't share a bathroom with me. We don't like your kind. Damn Satanists. Yeah. So it's kind of cool. You know, the idea that I've been thinking lately is Christians, Buddhists, Muslims, Jewish people. I'm not quite sure about Hindu people. I'm probably sure, but like maybe Sikh or Jain people. You know, we got a common enemy. We got a common foe. There's one group we don't like. And that's interesting to me because I would say, honestly, a more accurate... Um, description of my religious views i'd consider myself more of a, a christian buddhist hybrid and i'm sure there are a lot of like 
traditionally minded Christians or more conservatively minded Christians who would say uh, who wouldn't agree that those two ideologies are compatible. But I think of all the other religions that would be compatible with uh, Christianity, I would think it would be Buddhism, mainly because something like Zen Buddhism, there is no they don't really focus on like any kind of supernatural beings or deities. I mean, yeah, I mean, we'd respect Buddha. There are there's it. There are a lot of uh, mythological tales surrounding Buddha. That's undeniable. But yeah, I like to think of us as being on the same team. There's a romance to that idea that I find uh, pretty cool. So I guess my idea is that Plus, you don't see too many Christians and Buddhists beefing with each other. You know, mostly most of the beefing is either Christians and Jewish people or Christians and Muslim people. But you don't see too many like Christian people hating on Buddhists as much, not as much. And I'm not saying Buddhism is perfect either, because when I was living in Korea, I saw how the Buddhist temple was there and it was some corrupt bullshit. Korean Buddhist monks are some corrupt assholes. So I'm not saying that we're not without our flaws. But yeah. These Satanists, man, they're fucking assholes. Torturing animals and manipulating our lives to serve darkness. It's just a bunch of goddamn jerks is what they are. I don't like them. I don't like them. Dickheads. It's part of the reason why I like K-pop so much, you see. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, K-pop is just silly to you. I get it. You know, one, it's not in English, and two, it's pop, right? And a lot, you know, just pop in general, silly. Uh, American pop is silly as well, you know, because people like to make fun of like new kids on the block and in sync and backstreet boys, and they think, oh, okay, K-pop is just like that, except they don't even speak English. I get it, and I get the apprehension behind it, especially people who are like older and into more classical music and who don't understand the music. It's fine. You don't have to understand it. But I will tell you uh, one cool story. Um, so I'm in, you know, I'm here in Maryland, and I'm starting to get to know a few people. And there's this black lady that I know. Um, she's pretty cool. Uh, we hang out. We talk. Um, Man, she's she's got some wild views. I love talking to her. But yeah, she's cool. You know, she's like from Baltimore, right? Um, grows, you know, she lives in an all black neighborhood, single mother. And one day I was at her house and she was having like this get together. It was like some like a small get together. Um, I was like the only Asian guy. Everyone there was black. And uh, I walk out of the bathroom. I walk past her daughter's bedroom. And I look inside, and her daughter's room is just covered wall to wall with like K pop, like BTS and Blackpink. And I'm like, and this was before I became a fan of K pop. I didn't become a fan of K pop until like a little over a year ago. So before I was even a fan, because uh, at that time, I barely even knew who they were. So, but so I look into all these posters at all these like really pretty looking Korean people. I'm like, yo. So I go up to her mother. I'm like, what's up with all the pictures of Korean people in your daughter's bedroom? What's that about? And she was telling me, oh, my daughter loves K-pop. You know, she loves BTS. She loves Blackpink. I was legitimately surprised because, again, at the time, I was not a fan. This was a while ago, a couple of years ago. Sorry, I had to burp. It happens, folks. So she was, she told me that, you know, her daughter being like a 12 year old African American girl growing up in a predominantly black area in Baltimore, you know, she is exposed to a lot of modern like uh, hip hop. And, you know, one day she told her mom, according to the mom who told me that she just got tired of it because she was as a 12 year girl she was seeing all this music and it was basically just 
songs about like you know booty sex drugs money violence that's all it was you know it's like all the females in every rap video what are they they're just a bunch of booty bouncers right it's all about how fuckable you look and every song is either about sex or being really badass and killing people and you know this this girl's mom was telling me that yeah a lot of these young black kids are legitimately getting tired of that shit because it's getting old because it's just repetitive like it's just booty bouncing that's it that's all we're good for so her daughter started getting more into uh bts and blackpink because you know they're a little more wholesome more fun the messages and the lyrics were a lot more um positive um and there were a lot, a lot of it was like about bettering yourself and i get it uh because if you do listen to a lot of these uh k-pop lyrics they're they're pretty wholesome and a lot of them are, are pretty profound and deep like that's the thing about a lot of people don't get about bts like those motherfuckers are some straight up philosophers if you if you listen to some if you pay attention to some of their lyrics like if you uh put on some of their videos and turn on the subtitles and actually pay attention to some of the things that they're saying i mean i respect a couple of the members i really respect their minds i like legitimately like this dude is smart as fuck. this guy's on another level um and yeah they they talk about a lot of profound things um and a lot of what k-pop is as i've come to learn is trying to undo the bullshit of western music that's one of the major themes of k-pop uh in the lyrics and in the imagery and the videos there's there was this one video from this group called Dreamcatcher. it's a girl group it's it's like a bunch of girls you know like blackpink or spice girls or whatever but in this group or in this music video there's this one scene where one of the girls like does a superhero landing in a boardroom and at the head of like this table is like this um baphomet and then she walks up to it and she like crushes its head she like destroys it like with, with her powers and then you know you're like oh i know what that meant it was basically korean society or K korean music pointing the figure uh, finger at western music and being like hey what's up with all this satanic bullshit? this is supposed to be music it's not supposed to be about shaking your booty how do you even music is with the ears a booty shaking in front of you is with your eyes right you can't listen to a booty shake i mean i guess you could listen to a booty shake like flapping butt cheeks or something but you know what i mean and there's so many other uh songs in k-pop music videos where they're basically pointing at western society and they're like that's all you consider you use music expression for just to sing about sex and they call western society and western music out that's the thing i love about k-pop this is the thing i, I respect about it they will call Western uh, musicians out and being like, why you got all this satanic crap in your music, bitch? Just make decent music that people enjoy. That makes the world better. You fuck. Dumb fuck. But now these Western artists, right? You look at the Grammys and they're putting on some satanic shit. They got some sexual shit. And hey, I'm not against sexual stuff. You know, I, I jack off to porn sometimes. But I'm not listening to like porn music while I'm like, you know, driving my car. I want to listen to some good music when I'm driving my car, right? And again, you know, I used to like gangster rap and I, I, I like Sir Mix a lot, you know, but if that's all you're about, that's all you're about, I'm like, try something new so that's why that's one of the main reasons i mean there are other reasons why i like k-pop but that's the thing that really kind of turned my mind over because before i got into k-pop i was primarily into like metal and rock but because k-pop was like 
point the finger at Western society and be like, hey, what's up with all this satanic bullshit in your music? And they're singing about it and they're putting Western musicians on blast openly. You know, when BTS headlined uh, the Grammys, I mean, they headlined it. And, you know, they were inv- after the Grammys were over and after they had all their trophies or whatever, they were invited to all these hollywood after parties right and they refused to go because they they said they were ref- they didn't want to be a part of that bullshit. you know what they did instead they actually wound up going back to their hotel rooms and they were live streaming with uh, all of their fans and they just ordered a bunch of food and they just sat around eating a bunch of food and just talking with their fans like right after the grammys while everyone else was out at the after parties because they didn't want to be involved in that scene they just wanted to wanted to be involved with the people who are actually their fans and engaging them directly in a live stream and they would be stuffing their faces with like Korean food and shit while they were, they were doing it right after the Grammys. That's fucking cool. That's fucking down to earth. You got to respect the people like that who just like, you know what? I don't want to get even want to try to attend any of these after parties or become part of the scene. I want to stay away because y'all's into some satanic bullshit. We Asian people, we look at you from the outside looking in and we see a lot of horse shit. I respect that. That's why that when I learned about that, I was like, BTS, you guys are all right. So I guess my point is, is uh, pretty much, you know, when it comes to Satanism, you Christians out there, you ain't alone. You have allies. You know, I... I don't consider myself a Christian, but I do consider myself an ally of Christians, you know? So, yeah. It's fucking scary out there. There's a lot of dark, evil shit, a lot of dark, evil people. There's some decent people there, too. And there's some people who are in other countries and other cultures who are looking at everything that's going on here. And they're like, you know what? This is some bullshit. And they see your struggle. They see a common enemy. I think that's kind of cool. I'm not saying we will win. I hope we do. But if there's any takeaway from all this, if you ever do come across someone who um, admits or to being a Satanist or kind of aligns themselves with those views. You know, you got to do the right thing. And that's to punch them in the testicles. Real hard. For Jesus. Goodbye.